ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're sad to announce that there's been a, uh, we're investigating a triple homicide here in the city of Columbia. Deceased at the home at 2854 Robert Drive is a female by the name of Sherry Coleman. She's 31 years old. And her two children, Garrett Coleman, who's 11 years old, and Gavin Coleman, who is 9 years old. The Columbia Police Department was called to this house this morning, just before 7 a.m., and they then discovered these bodies. And shortly after that, Chief Edwards felt it uh, his responsibility to give this investigation the most he could, so he activated and authorized the use of the major case squad. Since that time, we've gathered together with investigators, and we have around 25 investigators working this crime. Uh, the Illinois State Police is involved. They're continuing their efforts at the scene, and we have investigators currently working this homicide. The autopsies are being conducted as we speak, so we don't know what the cause of death is, but we do uh, believe that the manner of, of death is homicide. Well, this time is so early on, I don't want to speculate into any motive. And if I go into random, then that means it's, there's maybe a motive behind that. I really don't know. We just, we're following leads. We have leads in this case. We're following them. And, uh, you know, I would, I would just let everyone know that we're doing all we can to find out what happened in this house. I'm not going to confirm any condition of the house inside. Uh, I don't think it's prudent upon us to, to comment on anything like that, of any evidence that's at the scene. I can confirm that there was some police interaction prior to this, but we're not going to get into any specifics about that. I don't want people to think that that's the only thing we're looking at, because a, a, an investigation of this magnitude, you have to look at all, all different areas. But that is one of the things that we are looking at. There, there was some interaction between an unknown individual and them, that just was suspicious in nature. Don't even know that it was a crime. It's just that they contacted the police and wanted to document some incidents. But I really don't want to get into any of that right now. It's just too early on in this investigation. As always with something like this, we need the public's help. Right now we don't have a suspect in custody and we're asking the public's help if they know anything at all to contact the Columbia Police Department. We've developed information that we believe one person is in, in, is actually involved in this homicide well we believe that this was not a random act that it was actually intended to kill the three members of this family at this time we are not going to release the name of that individual this is a very serious case and we don't want to jump to anything but to put the public at ease we don't feel this was a random act we feel this family was targeted it's been very tough on Joyce Meyer. She's put out statements. She's put out her condolences to the family, and she said she's, you know, praying for everyone in the family. So it's a tough time. Joyce Myers of Worldwide Joyce Myers Ministry says she's praying. Good to know. I'm glad she's praying. Somebody needs to pray. The entire family of her employee found strangled in their own bed. Welcome back to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. And today's episode, Sins of the Father, the Coleman Family Murders. This is an, another good case. A very involved case. Lots of research went into this one. It's, it's a toughie. Yeah. So as chief of security for the successful televangelist Joyce Meyer, Chris Coleman apparently had a target on his back. In November 2008, he began getting email threats against himself and his family. In January of 2009, threatening notes were left in the mailbox in front of his home. And then on May 5, 2009, at 6.45 a.m., Chris Coleman called his neighbor, Justin Barlow, who was a detective with the Columbia, Illinois Police Department. Chris said that he was returning home from his workout at the gym in St. Louis County, and he was concerned about his family. His wife, Sherry, should have been up by then with their two sons, 11-year-old Garrett and 9-year-old Gavin, but no one was answering the phone. 
So Chris asked Justin if he would go across the street to his house and check on his family. Now Justin knew that Chris had been getting these threats in connection with his job with Joyce Meyer, so he understood Chris's concerns. He slipped out of bed and got dressed, being careful not to awaken his wife and his two sons. He contacted the police station and requested backup. Now, just 10 minutes after Chris's call, Justin met Sergeant Jason Donjon on the Coleman's front porch. What the two policemen found in the Coleman home would shock and sicken them. Sherry, Garrett, and Gavin were dead, strangled to death with some type of thick cord or wire. Spray-painted across the walls and on the children's beds were obscenities, which seemed to be directed at Chris and at Sherry. Now we're going to examine the evidence, take a deep look at the Colemans themselves and the Joyce Meyer Ministries, and see where the facts have led us in this episode of True Crime Brewery, Sins of the Father. So first of all, I'm going to do a couple of five-star reviews, and then we'll get the beer board, then we can go down to the quiet end for our discussion. That's a good idea, because it is quiet tonight. It's very quiet. No baseball. No baseball. So, let's read a couple five-star reviews. A Different Take on True Crime by Jeff Barnador I listen to every true crime podcast I can find, and I can honestly say that they come at the genre from a different angle. They don't try to be super gory about the info, and at the same time they don't try to make jokes, which many others do, to no avail usually. They have their own style which works. So as long as they keep making them, I'm going to keep listening. And I think that you should, too. You won't be disappointed. Very, very nice. I thought it was a really nice, well-written. Yes. Yeah. So, Jeff Farnador, welcome to the brewery. Welcome, Jeff. And one more I'll read. Worth the Listen by Jack Sandy. Now, that reminds me kind of Jack Handy on Saturday Night uh-huh. Live. That's right. Deep Thoughts. So let's see what Jack Sandy's deep thoughts are. This husband and wife team discussed two of my favorite things, true crime mysteries and a beer. As a criminal justice major and brew pub owner in Beer City, USA, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, I can appreciate the beer descriptors that are well thought out and beautifully articulated, go Dick, and the research that goes into each case that is discussed. Thanks, you two. Cheers, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. So a brew pub owner, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. How close is Grand Rapids to your folks' home? Oh, geez, I don't know. A little ways. Oh, so it's not like next time we visit the folks we can just pop over? No, I don't think so. Well, okay. Yeah, it's probably three or four hours away. Ew. Not too bad. All right. So, Sandy, welcome to the brewery, and thanks a lot for your review. Yes, thanks a lot. So what have we got for a beer today? Well, we're still in Illinois. Seems like we've had several Illinois murders. Illinois, North Carolina, there are a few states that really we seem to keep coming back to. Well, we're in Illinois. So I'm going to do Sophie, which is a beer brewed by Goose Island Beer Company in Chicago. Now, Sophie is a Saison. And a Saison is a type of beer that's brewed in the winter, meant to be consumed in the summer months. It is a fairly complex style. Many are fruity, look for earthy yeast tones, mild to moderate tartness, a fair amount of spice, not very bitter, semi-dry and not too sweet. Well, that covers a whole gamut of things, doesn't it? It does. It's a, it's a broad description. <laughs> it is. Well, as, as I said, it's a complex style. So this particular one, Sophie, is a hazy yellow color with a small white head has a sweet kind of hard candy aroma. Hmm. Almost, uh, hard candy, cotton candy, something like that. So fruitish. A uh, hint of spice. Okay. And then definitely a cotton candy taste with some orange and some coriander. And it's a little bit on the yeasty side. It's a light to medium bodied beer. A very good beer for the summer. Okay. Well, it sounds interesting. I can't wait to try it. Let's open it up. Let's do that. All right, Julie, let's head on down to the quiet end. Enjoy the beer 
and talk about the case. The sins of the father. Okay. I'm going to go back. I don't want to be boring or anything, but I'm going to go back quite a ways to go over the relationship and give us a foundation of where things started so we get a good idea of how things worked out here, okay? I think that's a good idea. Just, uh, again, this is a kind of a tricky case. Yeah, I thought so. Sherry was born to Angela and Don Weiss on July 3rd, 1997, and she grew up in Cicero, an old town only seven miles west of Chicago. Now, it was a diverse neighborhood where Sherry explored and played stickball on their street. She joined the Girl Scouts, and she watched Chicago White Sox games. Now, she had one older brother, Mario, and Mario was very protective of Sherry. When Sherry was 10, the family moved to Tampa Bay, Florida, though. So Sherry adapted well there, though. She was friendly and outgoing. She played for her high school varsity softball team. She was also a cheerleader for the Largo High School Packers football team. Now her best friend in high school was Tara Lintz, who was in the drama club with Sherry. And they graduated in 1995. Around that same time, Sherry's parents divorced, and it was, it was a rough divorce. But Sherry worked as a waitress for about a year after she graduated, and then, kind of out of the blue, she joined the Air Force. And she was looking for adventure and an escape from her parents' lengthy, messy divorce, I guess. And she ended up being stationed at the Marine Corps base in Quantico, Virginia, after her basic training. So she patrolled the base as part of the military police's uh, canine unit with her German shepherd, who she loved, and she enjoyed her job. In February 1997, she fell in love with another young Marine in the K-9 unit, and his name was Christopher Coleman. Now, in early September 1997, Sherry was pregnant, and then the couple decided that they'd leave Quantico together and start a new life in southwestern Illinois, because that's where Chris's family lived. Chris's family had really deep roots in Percy, Illinois. That was an old coal mining town. And Chris's father, Ron, he worked in the mines for over a decade, until he became really involved in his religion, and he decided to become a full-time preacher. Yeah, and Sherry was from Illinois, too. I mean, maybe not that exact part, but uh, suburb of Chicago. Yeah, so, very different areas of Illinois. Yeah. Yeah, very different Ur- Urban backgrounds. versus rural. Yeah. So Chris breezed through high school, and he got decent grades, and he excelled in athletics. And then he enlisted in the military immediately upon graduating. So he was assigned to the K-9 unit also, and he worked on several presidential security details as well. Now, when he met the pretty and upbeat Sherry, he fell really hard for her. So they decided to marry when they found out about the unexpected pregnancy. But they were excited to start a life together. So Chris was 22 and Sherry was a year younger. So these were young kids, 21, 22 years old. They were young. Yep. And I guess uh, his parents weren't that excited about her being part of the family. No, they never seemed to be. They, they didn't really warm to her or anything. No, but I think they might have been tough people to win over, from what I've read. Well, it sounds like they would have been anyway, and I don't know that it was particularly Sherry that they didn't like, but uh, maybe whoever Chris was with, they wouldn't have liked. Possibly. Kind of the case of nobody's good enough for our son, maybe. Right. But her her family, at least at the beginning, mom and, and her older brother, really liked Chris. Yeah. Well, yeah. When the couple left Quantico, they planned to stop at, Chris parents, at Chris's parents and drive on to Chicago, and that's where Sherry's mom and her brother Mario lived. But things were really strange when they arrived at Chris's parents' home. And that's when Sherry realized Chris hadn't mentioned anything about her to them. So Ron and Connie Coleman were kind of rude to Sherry, and they seemed dismayed that she was even with their son. Well, yeah, I'm I'm sure they're probably rude by nature anyway. (laughs) But that's something tough to spring on your folks. Yeah, but he hadn't told them anything. Right. Yeah. You know, here's, here's, oh, by the way, I got a girlfriend and she's pregnant. And we're married, or getting married. Yeah, but if you're a man, you tell them before you get there, right? Of course you do. Of course. I don't know what he would have been thinking. Well, sensing their disapproval, Chris said nothing to them about his plans to marry Sherry. So he actually introduced Sherry to them as a friend who lived in Chicago, who he was just giving a ride home to. And Sherry put up with that. 
which surprises me. So, like I said, she wasn't a big hit with the parents, and Chris wasn't a huge hit with Sherry's family either, although they tried to be warm with him. Mario, Sherry's brother, though, thought he was kind of quiet and distant, not a real warm person. Yeah. Yeah. But they didn't actively dislike him like Chris's parents did towards Sherry. No, no. But on the third day of their visit, Chris and Sherry went to the Richard J. Daly Center in downtown Chicago, and they got married. And then Chris called home afterward and told his parents that they'd gotten married. Well, good. That time he manned up. Yeah, over the phone. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's easier than in person, right? (laughs) Yeah, sure. So Sherry and Chris went to live in his parents' area, Chester, Illinois. So Ron Coleman, Chris's dad, had a church there called Grace Church. It was this large, aluminum-sided building with a brick front, and it actually had an electronic sign out front that flashed various inspirational messages, such as, get exercise, walk with the Lord. You know, clever little things like that. Nothing like a little down-home religion to get you in the mood. (laughs) So Sherry's life was undergoing considerable adjustments, as Mm. you can see. She was pregnant, newly married. She lived among Chris's family, who seemed to think that she was a willful, and I put that in quotes, because that's actually what Chris's father said at one point, a willful big city girl who had trapped Chris into marriage. Yeah, see? Yeah. She got pregnant, trapped him. Right. Huh. But Chris was the Coleman's oldest son, and he was by all means their golden boy. But what seemed to bother them the most was that Sherry was not a born-again Christian like they were. So in the fall of 1997, not long after their move to Chester, Sherry converted to evangelical born-again Christianity. And that was at the urging of her mother-in-law, Connie. Now in 1998, she was a full member of the evangelical community, and she joined in worship that included speaking in tongues. So this was pretty pretty out there. This is hardcore. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that would surprise me more was if you told me they handled rattlesnakes, too. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't hear anything about them doing it, but yeah, I could see that. Speaking in tongues is pretty dramatic. It sure is. Garrett was born in 1998, and most people said he was a spitting image of Chris. Ron and Connie Coleman met Joyce Meyer at a prayer conference, and Joyce had said that she needed someone to train a guard dog for her. And that's when Ron and Connie introduced Chris to Joyce Meyer. So Chris trained her dog, and soon he landed a full-time job in the security department of Joyce Meyer's ministry. And that was based out of Fenton, Missouri. So Fenton, Missouri was quite a distance from Chester. So Chris and Sherry moved to the St. Louis suburb of Afton, and in late 2000, he applied for the position as the head of security for the entire Joyce Meyer ministry, which is a huge organization. And then they had a second son, Gavin, born in January of the year 2000. Well, he must have been pretty impressive. I mean, he's gone from training the the dog to having a job with the security department. I know. To being head of security in what seems like a relatively short time. Seems like it. Seems like he was ambitious. it, It must have been. And they must have seen something in him that wanted them to hire him as chief of security. Yeah, but I thought it was interesting that when he applied for the position as head of security, the application actually had a spiritual criteria section on it. Have you ever heard of anything like that? Any jobs you've ever applied to? Well, I (laughs) I apply to normal jobs. Oh, geez. Well, okay. Maybe maybe I didn't mean it exactly that way. Okay. No. You've never worked for a religious organization. I've never worked for a religious organization. And what's the spirituality clause? Well... I guess it's where you have to write your qualifications. It's the spirituality criteria, not clause. Criteria. So Chris wrote that he and his wife were born again and that he began to speak in tongues back in 1986. So this was something to be proud of in this religion, I guess. And he added that he did not drink, smoke, or use drugs and that he didn't have any other bad habits. So he got the position and with the help of an ex-cop named Dan Ward, He wrote a whole new procedural manual for the security department. And then Sherry began working for the ministry as well. And she worked actually in world outreach as part of a team that would travel with Joyce on missionary trips. And also during that time, she found the time to become an EMT. So these were motivated young people. They sure were. I'm impressed by all they did. These trips, these missionary trips were like to China and far, far away places. 
Right. They weren't just traveling around the central United States. Oh, no. These are big trips. Yeah. Now, as the two boys grew, their personalities were notably different. Garrett was quiet and reserved. Gavin, on the other hand, was a real performer. Big goofy smile and known to enter a room performing a somersault or a cartwheel and then looking around for the reactions in the room. Ta-da! So he sounds like a real cutie. But Chris was a stickler for order and obedience, and he demanded that everything be put in its place and that the boys use their indoor voices. On the other hand, Sherry could be kind of indulgent, their friends said. So Chris was the disciplinarian. Now, the ministry employees had said that Chris was a perfectionist, very tightly wrapped, without a friendly demeanor, and he could be explosive over seemingly minor things. But it didn't seem to matter to Chris what his co-workers thought of him, because he was really riding high, doing well. I mean, he was Joyce Meyer's right-hand man at this point, at a pretty young age, so. Yeah, he was doing quite well for himself, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what he was making at the beginning, but he ended up making over $100,000 a year right? as her chief of security. Mm -hmm. But we're going to find out that all might not have been as well as it appeared. Sure, you know, sure. With his job. Right, of course. It's true crime brewery. It's not That's they right. all lived happily ever brewery. <laughs> no, we don't, no, we don't do that, do we? No, we don't. So Joyce Myers has defined herself as a practical Bible teacher. She's also a prosperity preacher. Mm -hmm. So what a prosperity preacher is, or a prosperity theology, is a belief among some Christians that financial blessing and religious well-being is always the will of God for them and that faith, positive speech, and donations to religious causes will increase one's material wealth. So basically what that means is that the parishioners give money to Joyce, or whoever is the leader of the flock. Sure. And this allows, pardon my cynical view, no. this, this allows the leader to live a very, very comfortable lifestyle. Which is good. Why? For everybody else? Well, because there's kind of this trickle-down effect, and it keeps everyone happy. Ah. Supposedly. So that's kind of the classic televangelist thing. Send me money, and God will send you money. Right. Yeah, I don't know why people believe that. I don't believe that. Now, well, and there's plenty of people that criticize it, obviously. Sure. And <clears throat> a lot of Christian denominations criticize it. They maintain that it's an irresponsible faith, uh, promotes idolatry, and even worse, is contrary to scripture. Sure, I would so. think so. I mean, I don't know, but I think a lot of religions, they take a vow of poverty, and I would think the whole point of it, I'm not a religious person, but from what I know of religion, I thought you were supposed to help other people and share in the wealth. And One would think. Yeah. But this prosperity preaching it works out well for the, the person doing the preaching. Sounds like it. So... During public appearances, Joyce is not shy about preaching about the material benefits of faith. God has made her rich, she says, and if you stay in your faith, you're going to get paid. She blatantly appeals for money at her conferences. Plus, she's got tables full of merchandise, calendars, coffee mugs, CDs, books, audio books. As she speaks and preaches, there's a large video display on either side of the stage that reads, Buy hundred dollars, buy five hundred dollars worth of product and get one hundred dollars free. Yeah, that was in one of the videos. How can you turn I that saw. stuff down? What? You, how can you turn oh, it down? Man. You mean you're being sarcastic? I am. Okay. I I just. But it's so blatant. That's what stuns me. I know, and, and people such, and fall people, for people that do stuff. People do it. Yeah. I just. I, I don't I, understand it. I don't either. No, but it obviously works for her. And you know, if you're a religious organization. You're tax-exempt as well. You are. You really can't lose in that scenario, financially at least. So like a lot of other preachers in her position, she has her detractors. Sure. Count me among them, I would say. So she, she people find her preaching disgenuous, gimmicky, and exploitive sure. of poor, unwitting followers. Check, check, check. I would right, agree. right, right, right. Right. But one thing you might have to think, though. Yeah. Because he's in the prologue, he was getting threatening letters. And, yes. And yeah. emails. Right. So you, I don't think you could overlook that someone might resort to violence against her. I, yeah, I think that would be possible. Someone, someone could feel squeezed. Maybe 
they make fifty thousand dollars a year, and they've just given her ten thousand or something like that. Well, why would they do that then, though? Because she talked them into it. Wow, I don't know. I kind of can't blame her if they're falling for it, unless they're in some way vulnerable, if they're mentally well, challenged or elderly or. I don't know if they're necessarily mentally challenged, but I think they're all vulnerable because they forked up the money. And I think that these people prey on people like that. Well, let's not get on a soapbox here. All right. But I, I it was... <laughs> I don't want the evangelicals after me. I don't think we have a big evangelical following, but well, you never know. You never know. So anyway, it was Chris Coleman's job to keep Joyce Meyer safe. So when he received a significant pay raise, the Colemans moved to a new subdivision in Columbia Lakes, Illinois. Now the house was a white two-story colonial with an attached garage. They moved in in 2004. So this seemed like the perfect family neighborhood, and Sherry was really thrilled with the whole thing. She was a city girl, and this was all everything she could have hoped for. Now Sherry made friends in their new neighborhood. Her neighbor, Vanessa, had a boy near Gavin and Garrett's age, and the boys spent a lot of time at Vanessa's house, even some overnights. Yeah, they were good buddies. Yeah. And now Megan, or Megan, who worked for the Joyce Myers Ministry, she hired Sherry as her assistant, and those two were also very close friends. And then another friend, Kathy, was a Joyce Myers employee also, and she had a boy a year older than Garrett, so she was a good friend as well. But these three women didn't know each other, so even though Sherry had these three friends, the three friends never had a chance to compare notes on things that Sherry told them about her life, which will become important as we get to the crime. It certainly will be. Yeah. But Sherry seemed to be fighting a losing battle in winning the affection of her in-laws. So this was important to her, and it just wasn't working out. Well, I think if if I were her, this is all hindsight. Sure. But his parents are cranky old bastards, especially the father. So you know, I would just say, screw him. I don't have to have a relationship with him. I don't think that was really an option with Chris, well, though. Well, it wasn't. But no. It, you know, God. She was really trying. So despite their coldness toward her, she drove to Chester several times a month to visit Ron and Connie. So Chris was not only the chief of security for the ministry, but he also got to become Joyce's personal bodyguard. And this was because uh, Ron and Connie had introduced him, and they had kind of been following Joyce for a long time. So Joyce knew Chris from the time he was a child. You know, they weren't like close personal friends, but she knew of him right. because they followed her a lot. They followed her, and they, they modeled their yeah, church they after were, her stuff. Yeah, they wanted to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. They were on a much smaller scale. Way smaller. But anyway, Ron and Connie were bubbling over with pride with Chris's position in the church, as you can imagine. This well, was like sure. the best thing ever to them. Yeah. And in their eyes, he could really just do no wrong. So one Memorial Day weekend in 2008, Sherry's friend Vanessa and her husband noticed that Sherry had a lot of bruises on her upper legs. Vanessa realized that Sherry usually wore long sleeve shirts and long skirts or pants, so it occurred to her then that maybe Chris was abusing Sherry, but she just couldn't believe that. She couldn't convince herself that that was true because he really seemed like an ideal husband and father to her. The people in the neighborhood actually looked up to Chris. So around that time, Sherry sent her friend Megan a text, and this was shocking because she said in the text, Chris is gone right now. But he just beat me up. I'm okay, though. Huh. So Megan was just shocked, and she had no idea that Chris was abusive at all. Right. But she showed the text to her husband, and then she called Sherry and said, We're coming to pick you and the boys up right now. You can't stay there. Absolutely. But Chris was on a trip, and Sherry refused to go. She insisted it wouldn't happen again. So Chris came back, and things, you know, I guess went back to normal. We've heard that before. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm going to forgive him. He's sorry. It won't happen again. Right. And it does. It almost always does. It almost always does. So we have a friend who's noticed mysterious bruises. Yes. And another friend who Sherry's spoken to and said she was beaten by her husband. Right. But these two friends don't talk to each other, so they right. haven't shared so this. So they, they can't compare notes or anything. Right. 
So at future meetings with Megan, though, Sherry told her that they were getting along and things were great with Chris and it hadn't happened again. So Sherry was obviously covering it up. Right. But I noticed I, in the, the stuff we've looked at yeah. that she did vacillate back and forth. She, she vacillated about beatings and mal, maltreatment at his hand versus everything's hunky-dory in the marriage. Well, I think he could easily win her back over. I think he was charming sure. and she was she just went for it and believed it. Yeah. Or she just wanted to so much, I guess. So, but she had kept in touch with her high school friend, Tara Lintz. But Tara was divorced now and living in the Tampa Bay area. And Tara also knew Chris because she had visited Sherry and Chris in Quantico years earlier. But more recently, she'd met up with them while they were on vacation in Disney World. They'd met up with Tara. So in October of 2008, Sherry called Tara because she wanted to tell her that Joyce Meyer was having a three-day conference in Tampa. And Sherry suggested that Tara attend. She thought Tara's lifestyle was a bit loose, you know, with, uh, I guess she was a cocktail wait waitress and she had different boyfriends. And Sherry was genuinely concerned about Tara and she thought she might benefit from going and hearing Joyce Meyer's preaching. Well, that's a good thought. I mean, not, not listening to Joyce Meyer's, but she's got <laughs> a, a friend from high school. Yeah. Uh, who she's wanting to help. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely something nice, nice she wanted to do, yeah. So I, I guess Tara thought that might not be a bad idea to go to the conference. And when Sherry told Chris that Tara might be there, uh, she half-jokingly warned him against meeting with her. She knew that Tara could be flirtatious. Yeah, and she was an attractive woman, but so was Sherry. Yeah. Yeah. Little did she know. So Chris went to Tampa ahead of the conference to make all of the security plans. Once in town, he met Tara for dinner and drinks. By the time of the conference, they were spending every minute together. Mm. Sounds like love at first sight, or second or third sight. Sounds like trouble to me. So they pretty quickly started an affair and proclaimed their love for one another. Even when the conference was over, Chris asked Joyce Meyer if he could stay in Tampa for a few extra days, which she agreed to. Yeah. So when he got home from his Tampa trip created a document on his, on his laptop titled All About Tara. Gag me. The, the document listed her birthday, her dog's birthday, her height, weight, clothing sizes, favorite sports teams, songs, perfumes, and ice cream flavors. He also wrote that November 5th, 2008 was the day that Tara changed my life and that their future daughter's name would be Zoe Lynn Coleman. Now, this so, sounds really childish and like you Doesn't it? sounds like and, we're in high school or something or even junior high school. Yeah. And it happened pretty quickly. Right. Right? Yeah. So there, there's a couple of things I would ask. Okay. One, one would be that things weren't good in their marriage anyway. Yeah. Well, I think that everyone agrees they were, they were having right. trouble and he was obviously abusive to Sherry as the, well. The other thing is that they've met before. So maybe. There's even earlier. Um, ah, I liaisons. hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Could have been. Or at least there was an attraction there, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, so Chris and Tara had big plans, I guess. They did. Just yep. one tiny little problem. Yeah. Well, actually, two problems. Okay. He was still married to Sherry. That's the one I was thinking of. And if he divorced Sherry, he might lose his job with the Joyce Myers Ministry. Oh, yeah. Right? Because That's remember, right. they had this big spirituality this criteria that you had to meet. Spirituality stuff. And probably adultery doesn't fit into that. I'm certain it doesn't. So, on November 14th, Joyce Meyer and Chris received these identical emails, and the emails were entitled, Fuck Chris. And the Google account it came from was destroychris at gmail.com. So, the... Email, it said something like, um, tell Joyce to stop preaching the bullshit or Chris's family will die, it began. So if you jackasses are like any other company, this will be someone's account. Pass this on to Chris. Then it went on saying that the writer knew when Chris wasn't home and when he was home and that he would go and kill Chris's family. And then there were some similar emails over the next few weeks. And Chris reported the emails to the Columbia Police Department so to be on the safe side, the Columbia PD provided some extra patrols in the Coleman's neighborhood. 
So Chris was becoming more and more hostile towards Sherry, though, at the same time. He'd actually said to her that the sight of her repulsed him. He told her that she was an obstacle to his happiness, and so were the boys. And on the evening of November 25th, Chris cornered Sherry in their kitchen and told her that he was divorcing her. He said that she and the boys were getting in the way of his career. Now, he didn't mention his relationship with Tara, although I think that was at the heart of it. Well, absolutely. But Sherry, she didn't want a divorce. She said she still loved Chris, and she called around to members of her church and asked them to pray for her marriage. That's a great step. So in mid-December, Chris traveled to Florida with Joyce Myers, and he dropped Joyce off at a vacation cruise, and then he met up with Tara again at an Orlando hotel. And the next day they exchanged promise rings, so isn't that cute? It is. Is this where they were also making sex tapes and stuff too? I think that was in Hawaii. Okay, but they did that. Yeah. So Sherry called Chris on December 21st and asked him to come home. I mean, the holidays are coming. They've got two little boys. But he refused. And he told her, hey, you and the boys are keeping me from realizing God's destiny for my life. So this <laughs> guy's a real dick. And not in a good way like you are. He's a bastard. But on December 24th, Chris was home. So Sherry told him she wouldn't divorce him. And he was really mad. And she said, I'm never leaving you. What are you going to do? Kill me? Whoops. Yep. So and she also contacted friends at the Joyce Myers Ministry and the church she attended, which was also another one of those evangelical churches. Yeah. Destiny Church, I Destiny think it was. Destiny Church, right. And she was asking the people there to pray for her marriage. And moving into the new year, January 2nd, 2009, Chris contacted the Columbia Police Department saying he'd just found a disturbing letter in his home mailbox. Type letter on plain paper. Fuck you, it read. Deny your God publicly or else. No more opportunities. Time is running out for you and your family. Hmm. So maybe Sherry overheard one of Chris's phone conversations or saw some text, but she eventually figured out that Chris was having an affair with Tara. Right, yeah. So she's getting desperate now. Uh, and she decided to call Joyce and David Meyer's son, Daniel, in an attempt to save her marriage. Joyce and Dave met with Chris the next day and asked him about his marriage. He didn't admit to an affair, but admitted to marital problems. Hmm. They asked him to go to marriage counseling with a pastor from their office. Right. So, yeah, he can't admit to an affair, right? That would, I mean, divorce would certainly jeopardize his job. Well, especially but, if it was because he had an affair. That would right. make it even worse. But the adultery would probably put the kibosh on his career with Joyce Myers also. Well, yeah, I guess if Sherry had divorced him, it would have been okay, and that's what he wanted. But Sherry yeah. refused to do that. Well, if, if she divorced him and they never found out that he'd been having an affair, right. he'd be safe. Right. But that's not. she wasn't going to grant him a divorce. No, she wasn't. So Chris had to attend the counseling, because otherwise he'd lose his job, of course. Right. But he was really furious with Sherry, as you can imagine. I'll bet he was. And over the next few months, Sherry gave conflicting reports of her marriage to family and friends. Sometimes she told people that things had improved, and other times she admitted that Chris was verbally abusive, and he told her that she and the boys were ruining his life. And I'm betting at this time that he was very abusive, because he was angry. I think that's a pretty accurate statement. Yeah. So in the... On the other hand of things, Tara gave Chris a deadline for serving divorce papers on Sherry. Right. So she, he told her he's divorcing Sherry to marry her. They've yeah, even got a wedding date planned. They do. They're, they're moving right ahead with plans. So the deadline for him to serve divorce papers on Sherry was May 4th of 2009. But Chris knew if he divorced Sherry, he would lose the six-figure income, the prestigious position, which his parents thought was the greatest thing ever. And that was a big part of Tara's attraction to him. He knew that he had this great job. Yeah. And if he didn't get divorced, he would lose Tara anyway. So either way, he was going to lose Tara. And he didn't know what to do. He probably would have. So in April, Chris had an assignment with Joyce Meyer in Hawaii. And he spent a week in a hotel with Tara during this time. It was kind of a early honeymoon for the, for the love births. Right. Now, I, I'm not sure. You know, he's, he's there with the ministry. 
doing security? Did he hide Tara the whole time? She just stayed in the hotel room? I mean, Probably. They, they couldn't be seen together. Not with Joyce Meyer, but we do find out that he did. they did go out as a couple a lot in Florida and other places yeah, when where, Joyce wasn't around. Where they wouldn't be seen. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't be seen by certain people. By the wrong people. Right, right. Or the right people. But Tara's friends down there knew they were a couple and thought they were getting married. Yeah. So they get back from Hawaii. Uh, late April, Chris went to the Columbia Police Department again because there was another threatening letter found in the mailbox. Mm-hmm. Sounds like the last one. Fuck you, the letter read. This guy's really literate, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I am giving you the, your, the <laughs> last warning. Your worst nightmare is about to happen. Jeez. Wow. And yeah. there's there's more fuck yous in there, too. Oh, okay. So the guy across the street who was the detective, Justin Barlow, Yeah. Uh, he agreed to set up a video surveillance camera in the window of his son's bedroom. And from there, he could watch the Coleman's mailbox. A couple of days later, Chris installed a home security system. So he's got something in his house. His neighbor's got something doing the outside of the house. Should be covered, right? I would think so, yeah. They're, they're being careful. So on May 1st, the Coleman's had their neighbors, Kathy and Bob LaPlante, over for a backyard barbecue. Chris took Kathy and Bob down to the basement after dinner and showed them the security DVR system. He was proud of it. Yep. He also told them that the previous evening... One of his outdoor cameras had caught a masked figure putting another threat letter into their mailbox. That's what he said, although that would turn out to not be true. That's a lie. Yeah, because, because we have the other camera the across other, the street. The other camera never saw Didn't anything. see that. Right, so if we go to Monday morning, May 4th, Chris called into work and said that he had to take the day off. Now, Chris had never called out from work before. I mean, never. Right. So he took the boys to school, he went grocery shopping, and he spent the rest of the day at home. And around 6.30 p.m., Gavin and Garrett were playing at their neighbor Vanessa's house with um, her son Brandon, that was about Garrett's age. And they asked Vanessa if they could spend the night. So Vanessa said, oh, of course you can, because every year on May 4th, the boys stayed over because they would celebrate Brandon and Garrett's birthdays, which were less than a week apart. So Brandon's was on April, no, Garrett's was on April 30th, and Brandon's was on May 5th, I think, or vice versa. But the two boys had birthdays like a week apart, so for the past several years, they'd spent the night together. Yeah. Yeah, on May 4th. But Chris told the boys they couldn't stay over. He said it wasn't a good night for it. And Vanessa was kind of surprised, but what's she going to say? I know. Right. So she watched the boys as they walked home. She sent them home about 8.25 p.m. that night and said, we'll do it another night. So Tara called Chris that evening and asked if he'd served Sherry with the divorce papers. It was May 4th. That was his deadline. But there were no divorce papers. Chris hadn't even gone to a lawyer. Right. Now, he couldn't divorce Sherry and keep his job at Joyce Meyer Ministries. A very big quandary. But he couldn't tell that to Tara. So he told her the divorce papers had some typos and that the lawyer was having them redone, and he would serve them to her the next day, May 5th. So Chris went up, he said prayers with the boys that night, and tucked them in and kissed them goodnight. And he also texted Tara Lintz over 50 times that evening. So at 6.43 a.m. on May 5th, Detective Justin Barlow's cell phone rang, and it was Chris Coleman. He said that he was concerned about his family. Sherry should have been up with Garrett and Gavin, and she wasn't answering her phone. So he asked if Justin would mind running over and checking on them. So Detective Barlow called the police department for backup and walked over to the Coleman's house. He rang the front doorbell, he waited, he rang it again, but no one answered. And then he started thinking, well, where's Chris? He should have been there by now. Because when he called, he said he was crossing the Jefferson Barracks Bridge, which was uh, no more than seven-minute drive from there to the house. So before Chris even showed up, Sergeant Jason Don John pulled up in a squad car, and he parked at the curb. Now it was 6.53 a.m. It was 10 minutes, 10 minutes since Chris had called. So Don John left Barlow on the front porch, and he went around to the rear of the house. 
There was a basement window open, and the grass in the backyard was dew-covered with no footprints on it. So he radioed Barlow up front in the front of the house, and he told him to come out back. So Barlow came around with him and shined his flashlight through the window. The basement floor appeared clean. The window was unlocked and opened. The screen was just sitting um, next to the house, neatly. And Don John radioed dispatch for backup because he found this all quite odd, quite an odd situation. Nobody was answering the door. It's early morning. This window's just open. What's going on? Exactly. And... I would have been suspicious from the start just because, I mean, if the guy's six, seven, eight minutes away from home, why is he calling to have someone check? Yeah, that's kind of weird. And then why isn't he there? Yeah, and then... You think you'd hurry home if you were worried. If he was worried. I mean, if he's worried, I wouldn't have even called. I would have gotten home fast. Yeah. And if I'm worried enough that I call my police officer neighbor... I'd still be hurrying home. Yeah, why not he, just call 911 if you're that concerned? Kind of meandered home. Yeah. It's so suspicious. It sure is. But we're going to find out that it, they were suspicious of him almost from the get-go. Yeah, yeah. So the men climbed through the window with their guns drawn. Don John called out Columbia PD several times, but no one answered. The house was silent. Barlow led the way upstairs to the main floor. They are hit with a strong smell of spray paint. On the kitchen wall next to the doorway were framed family photos. Someone had sprayed a message in red paint across the wall and on some of the photos. It said, fuck you. See, this guy is still pretty literate, isn't he? That sounds familiar. Yeah. yeah. I am always watching. On the adjoining wall, another message. I saw you leave. They would slowly move into the living room where another spray painted message said, fuck you, bitch. Punked. Punked. Punished. Punished. (laughs) That's tough writing to read. Yeah. It's a spray paint. Yeah. On the wall of the stairway to the second floor, another one read, You have paid. Oh. So that was... That's ominous, isn't it? It's an ominous thing, yeah. Yeah, so Officer Steve Patton also arrived as backup. And he came to the house just as Chris Coleman was pulling into his driveway. So at this point, it's 6.56, which is 13 minutes since Chris had called Justin Barlow. So he's a good five minutes later than he would have expected. Than he should have been, yeah. And This is from the guy who's supposed to be really worried about his family. Yeah. Sorry, I'm taking all your thunder here. (laughs) No, you're not. No, they heard the garage door open because Chris had pulled in and opened the garage door. And the policeman told Chris to stay outside while they did a search of the house. Chris didn't argue or say, no, I want to see my family, I want to come in, anything like that. And the three policemen reached the top of the stairs together. Now, 11-year-old Garrett's room was almost directly in front of them when they got to the top of the stairs. And through the doorway, they could see him curled up in bed. Now, the bad thing was that there was red spray paint on his blanket, which is a bad sign. Yes. Yeah. So the three policemen, they split up, and they each searched a separate bedroom. Detective Barlow, he went into Garrett's room, and he was lying on his left side with his blanket covering his lower half. But his lips were blue, his skin was gray, there were ligature marks on his neck, suggesting that he had been strangled. When he touched him, his skin was cold and stiff. Stiff. Rigor mortis had set in. Now Steve Patton went into Gavin's room, There was a red spray-painted message on the nine-year-old's sheets. Fuck you, it read. Now Gavin was face down on the bed. His bare right foot poked out from the sheet. And he, too, had ligature marks on his neck. He was wearing his Spider-Man pajamas. Now Patton touched his arm. Hey, buddy, he said. Gavin's arm was cold to the touch. His skin was a horrible purplish gray. And Patton knew right away that the boy was dead. Now Sergeant Don John had gone into the master bedroom, and he saw Sherry lying face down on the bed. She was naked. Her hair was draped over her face. He put the palm of his hand under her shoulder and tried to lift her up. 
but he was horrified. Her whole body moved as if it was locked in one place. She was very stiff. So this family had been dead. This family had been dead for several hours. It seems that way. So Steve Patton called out, the boy in here is dead. And Don John replied, the mom's dead too. And the three policemen met in the upstairs hallway. Their hands were shaking. This is not something they're accustomed to. No, this or is that a anyone would be. It's a small town. Yeah. They, they probably have a, a murder every 10 years or something. Right. If that. So they heard Chris yell from downstairs, what's going on? What's going on? So they thought they'd have to fight him to prevent him from coming up, but he let Sergeant Don John lead him away into the garage. Now Sergeant uh, Detective Barlow told Chris his family had been killed. Chris didn't ask how. He started to cry, and then he took out his Blackberry and said he needed to call work and call his father. So right then, he was just immediately the prime suspect. Yeah, he just wasn't acting like a grief-stricken husband and father. No, and the whole situation was weird. Wasn't it? And Detective Barlow and the Illinois State Police Detective Dave Bivens questioned Chris. Chris told them he got up at 5.30 a.m. that morning and left for Gold's Gym at 5.43. He'd called Sherry's cell at 5.43 just after leaving the house to wake her up. Now, why wouldn't he have just touched her shoulder or said, wake up, before he left? Why would you go out to the car and then call as you're driving away. That was odd. Yeah, but that's how he was making his alibi. I suppose. They were suspicious. Didn't seem right. Yeah. Then he also texted her at 623 in the morning saying, I've got about five more minutes on the cardio, then I'll be home. Mm -hmm. And twice more at 627, then at 634 and 653 asking if she was up. Chris talked about his job and the threats as the detectives took notes. When Chris was left alone in the interrogation room, he flipped through the detective's notes and peeked at his Blackberry, so he wanted to check things out here. Chris denied having an affair, he claimed his marriage was maybe a little bit on the tough side, but they were working things out. Yeah. Denied the affair, but admitted to talking and texting a ton with Tara Lynn's. Yeah. who he claimed to be a friend. But the Columbia Police Department or the investigative team contacted the St. Petersburg, Florida Police Department, and a detective went to interview Tara Lins. She was telling a very different story. She said that she and Chris were in love, that Chris was filing to divorce his wife, Sherry, and she and Chris were planning a lifetime together. Hmm. So, so don't you think the, he would have thought that, yeah, they're going to call her? Did he think they weren't even going to investigate? I mean, I kind of feel like he thought he was just so great and above everything, no one was even going to question him. I guess so. I mean, he's the head of security for Joyce Meyer's ministry, so he probably thinks that whatever he says, people are going to believe. Well, right? he's sadly mistaken. Well, I mean, if, if there was a primer on how not to commit a murder, he read that book. Yeah, right. I mean, there, there's so many things, and, and I know you're going to talk about almost all of them, or all of them. Yeah. But uh, it's obvious that the police suspected him from the very start. Yes. They made sure they eliminated other possibilities, other possible suspects, but he's the one. Mm. Well, like you said, he initially denied that he was having an affair with Tara, and he changed his mind when he found out that Tara was talking to them. Well, what's he going to do? <laughs> so still he tried to downplay the relationship, though. And he went through this lengthy interview without ever asking how his family had been killed. He didn't ask police to check his home security system for the footage of the killer, either. Which you would have thought would be his first thought is, hey, I had cameras. Yeah. But he didn't say anything about that. So, like you said, they suspected him, especially because he'd left the house that morning at 5.43. Now, the family had been found dead just over an hour later, and it was obvious that they'd been dead for much longer than an hour. Yeah, I think they had some reviews of the autopsy and the bodies, and the, the pathologist that they called in said maybe anywhere from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. Yeah. 
It was when they had been killed. Right. So yep. nobody else in the house then. No, no. They Well, his whole thing was that he, they were alive when he left, and we know that's not true. No. Nope. Right. Yeah. And did you recall, I mean, the other thing I thought was interesting was that he went to this gym in, what, East St. Louis or someplace? Yeah. And it was like the third time he'd ever been there. Well, the the creepy thing is he just started going there like a week after he started the affair with Tara. Right. So it makes you think he was planning he, this way back then. He was. Well, yeah, I, I think that he was planning this almost from the time he and Tara became intimate. Yeah. Uh, but he joined this gym, didn't go f- to it for months, and then went to it like the week or so before Yeah. the, the killings and then the day of the killings. So like three times. Mm. And, and this was an alibi place for him. Seems like it. Because it's not his usual gym that he worked out at. Right. So 25 investigators from the major case squad were assigned to this case on a full-time basis. And they performed some exhaustive searches and many interviews, of course. And investigators also interviewed Joyce Myers, her family, and Sherry's friend at the ministry, Kathy LaPlante. Now, Kathy's boss, according to her, called her on May 6th and told her, to only tell the police basic facts and not her opinions on the case. So she was afraid of losing her job, so she kind of held back in her interview. But then her conscience finally got the best of her, and she called police back and told them more things in a second interview about things that Tara had told her and things that she'd seen in the home, abusive things. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so on the route from Chris's house to the gym... Investigators found a piece of baling twine that had been fashioned into a noose, a latex glove stained with red paint, and the faceplate for the digital video recorder from Chris's home security system. In the Coleman's basement, someone had torn off the faceplate and removed the recorder by carefully unscrewing the attachments and leaving all of the wires intact. <laughs> so, Very clever. Well, I don't know how clever that is, but... They did see there were some um, bales of hay out back, and one of the one of the twine, uh, one of the baling twines was missing. Right. And it turns out that that was it. And it was the same same twine. Yeah. That was used or probably used to commit the murders. Right. So his whole story is falling apart, and he's looking pretty guilty at this point. He is. We've got a lot of strikes against him. Uh, admittedly, circumstantial. I suppose. Because he's not confessing. Right. But there's a lot of stuff that indicate that he's at uh, the bottom of it. Sure. I don't know. Are the bodies being dead for so long? Is that circumstantial? Well, I guess. Yeah, yeah it, I guess it, it is. is. Yeah. But he was the only one in the home. There was no DNA showing anyone else. No, no other person's home. DNA. And the uh, video camera across the street and the, the policeman's house right. failed to show anybody. Didn't show anyone coming to the house. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Huh. So Chris resigned from his position at Joyce Meyer's Joyce Meyer Ministries after being questioned about a violation of their moral conduct policy. A little late. Joyce Meyer testified that she was unaware of his affair until police told her when the case went to trial. I don't know if I believe that, but that's beside the point. Sure. Autopsy and crime scene investigation showed a probable scenario of the murders. Killer went after Sherry first. He wrapped the ligature around her neck and tried to strangle her in her sleep. She woke up and fought. Killer beat her and wrapped the ligature around her neck a second time, this time finishing her off. That's horrifying. Gets worse. In the process, some of Sherry's hair was caught in the ligature. Killer then went into Gavin's room to strangle him. But Gavin woke up. There was a struggle, and Gavin was strangled with the same ligature. And at this time, Sherry's hair was transferred to Gavin's neck. Then he went and strangled Garrett. So Garrett probably saw his own father as he killed him. Yeah. Blech. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, so searches of Tara and Chris's cell phones revealed that Chris had texted Tara from the interrogation room, actually, on May 5th. So his family's just been killed, he's being interrogated, 
And he's texting his girlfriend. Good move. Yeah. So he also had texted her from Sherry Garrett and Gavin's funeral. Now, Chris had tried to delete most of the compromising images and texts from his phone while he was in the interrogation room. So that's part of what he was doing as well as texting her. But investigators were able to retrieve them because they have ways to do that, which I guess Chris Coleman didn't realize. As a security person, you'd think he might have known that. You would. Yeah. But I guess he wasn't that sophisticated. That I guess the explanation was that uh, the things get saved as kind of like a hard drive on a computer. Right. And you can erase them, but they're never completely gone. Right. Well, I think a cell phone is a computer, right? Well, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Now, Chris's laptop revealed that he had sent the email threats from his laptop, or someone had sent them from his laptop. Right. And the written, typed threats from January 2nd and April 27th were also typed up on that laptop. They were. Which read, that just led the investigators to believe that Chris had been planning the murder since way back in November 2008. He had. And, and the theory was that uh, Tara was forcing his hand because she was expecting divorce papers to be served. Right. And he needed to act. Sure. Well, that makes perfect sense. Doesn't it? Yeah. So Chris was arrested at his parents' house on May 19th. So just two weeks later. So he wasn't really getting away with it for very long. No. And at his arraignment, he pled not guilty to three counts of first-degree murder. In September, the case was designated as a death penalty case, and the judge determined that Chris was indigent, and he was assigned two experienced death penalty defense attorneys. So good attorneys. And I read that actually, if you get designated as a death penalty case, you actually are lucky in some ways because you get more money and you get better attorneys. You get the cream of the crop. Right. Now, the prosecution had continued its investigation, of course, and it was revealing some striking similarities in syntax, style, and spelling between Chris's writing samples and the threats from the letters and also on the walls. Well, they already know that doing the, the IP search that it was Chris's computer. And now they know that the handwriting is similar. Right. Uh, Circumstantial still. It is. Of course, the defense attorney mm -hmm. said anyone could have used that computer. Well, yes and no. No, Just a person couldn't sit down at the computer and type the death threats. No. You needed passwords and everything. Oh, for the emails. Right. Right. So that's assuming that he, he opened this account, destroychris at gmail.com. Right. Right. Because I think those were the only emails sent from that account. The only emails were the threats. Yes. Yeah. That was it. Right. And it would be virtually impossible for a, another person to get into that account. Well, they'd have to physically be in his home. Right. Yep. Because the computer's off, it can't be remotely can't reached. Can't be accessed remotely. Right. Yeah. So, of course, it's looking like he did it. Yeah. So the prosecutor had irrefutable evidence that Chris had sent the threats. Plus, there was a huge amount of circumstantial evidence. So I was just going to go over a few of the things, which we've already kind of mentioned. We have, but I, th I think if you list them in succession, I, th I think people will see what a strong case they had against him. Sure. So first of all, there was this odd behavior when he returned home on the morning of the murders. Also, what we didn't mention at that point is he had scratches on his arms. That he right. said that he said that maybe he'd gotten them by hitting the gurney, but he'd only hit the pillows on the gurney. Right. Because when it happened, an ambulance came, and he was sitting in the back of an ambulance for a while. He was. And a preacher, somebody from the ministry, came to talk to him as well as his father. Right, and he actually tried to hide the scratches at the police station during the interrogation. Yeah, he said he was cold, asked for a blanket. Right, and, and it was hotter than hell in the interrogation. And room. wrapped his arms. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he hadn't been in the habit of driving to the gym that he went to the morning until, um, this is that gym we were talking about, which is a, was a ways away. So he'd never started going there until November 15th. And that was the day after the threatening emails were sent. So mm -hmm. it seems to 
just work into being part of his plot. Right. Right. So he text messaged Tara continuous, continuously on November 14th, except there was a lull between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m., and that was actually the time when the Destroy Chris at Gmail account was created. So that's awfully circumstantial. Yeah. Very coincidental. That's for sure. Yep. And then on May 4th, he told Garrett, he told Garrett that it wasn't a good night to sleep over at Brandon's house. Even though that was a habit or right. a, a particular tradition that they did. Now that's probably the one that haunts me the most. That just gives me chills that he wouldn't let the kids spend the night at the friends. Well, he needed to kill them. Oh, that's just. You know, isn't that horrible? It's so horrible. I can't, I can't believe it. I just really have a hard time believing that he did this. I don't understand it at all. I don't either. They said he actually played catch with the boys the day before. Took them for snow cones. Yeah. Tucked them into bed. They showed pictures of them from the neighbor's video camera. That's right. They're out in the front yard. Playing catch. Playing catch. Jeez. Wow. Just too much. Too much. So, to ensure an impartial jury, jurors were selected in Pickneyville, Illinois. And then they bust them in for the trial. So I'd never heard of anyone doing that. Me either. But I, I guess mean, it's cheaper than moving the whole trial. Yeah. But yeah. They, they would bust these people in and out each day. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And the trial began on April 25th, 2011. And then the jurors began their deliberations on May 4th. So that's like two years later. Because he was actually convicted on May 5th, 2011. You know, exactly to the day, two years after the murders. Right. How weird is that? Very. Yeah. So on May 6th, there was a hearing to determine if Chris was eligible for the death penalty. And the hearing was only a formality because Illinois' new anti-capital punishment law was going to take effect on July 1st. So he was technically found eligible, but the judge sentenced him to life imprisonment. Life imprisonment. With the poss- without the possibility of parole. So Chris was sent to the Pontiac Correctional Center, a maximum security prison about 100 miles south of Chicago. Forever. Ex- yes, Except for he's life. been moved. He's been moved to another one. Right. Yeah. But he's not ever getting out of jail. No, no, he's in prison for life. So some interesting things that I read about was this prosperity gospel which we mentioned earlier. Now, if you if you read about it, you could wonder, did it foster Chris's sense of entitlement? Does it foster narcissism? Well, it certainly does for the person receiving the money. Yeah. Right? Right. Now, he's an extension of that person. He's her security chief. Yes. So. So you think it could? I think it could. I do, too. And also, I think about the way that his parents treated him, this whole golden boy thing that yeah, could have I was fueled. I hoping you'd bring that up. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, that could really fuel this sense of self importance, kind of like Scott Peterson. Right. He was the golden boy, and he just felt like so important that when he killed Lacey or when Chris killed Sherry and the boys, it really didn't matter. They weren't as important. Not as important as him. Right. He's like on a different level. Yeah. Yeah. So you think that, what do you think about the parental treatment? Well, the, the parents come off as being a couple of shits. Just really yeah. nasty people. I mean, they've never shown any remorse towards Sherry or her family or no. the, the grandkids. And even in interviews, they never mention the boys. No. Yeah. I mean, they, they just are world class pieces of work. And these are extremely religious people. Well, don't get me going on that. Okay. I'm going to leave that alone. So how could Chris commit these murders? I mean, I think he believed he was divinely privileged and entitled to this whole destiny, to God's destiny for him, which is part of the preachings of this prosperity gospel. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I guess I don't really understand what prosperity gospel is, other than the scam of getting people to send you money. What is the preaching supposed to say? Why? (laughs) Just why, I guess. 
I, I don't think you can answer that. Yeah. Uh, it emphasizes the importance of personal empowerment. Okay? Sure. Proposing that it is God's will for his people to be happy. Well, there you go. Okay. So Chris thought he had the right to be happy regardless of other people. Right. Hmm. The atonement or the reconciliation with God is interpreted to include the alleviation of sickness and poverty, which is viewed as curses to be broken by faith. Whoa, hold it. Time out. Uh -huh. So now I'm really hearing this. So it's kind of blaming poor people for being poor. Exactly. Wow. So if people are poor, they just aren't believing enough. If you believe enough, you won't be poor. Right. Pretty much. Right. Wow. But the contradiction to me is that the, the poorer people are encouraged to donate their money to this cause, and somehow that's going to get them to a happier state. Well, that's the whole scam part of it, I you think. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, I just find this Joyce Meyer an interesting person. Now, she was <laughs> she was born in St. Louis in 1943. Her father went into the army, army and fought in World War II. So she has said in interviews that he began sexually abusing her upon his return, and she discusses this experience in her meetings. So she's a graduate of a technical high school in St. Louis. She married a part-time car salesman shortly after. And then her life has led has been going into this whole religious preaching stuff, right? How so, did she how did she come into this? Did she have a revelation or something? Yes. She said that uh she says that she was praying intensely while driving to work one morning in 1976 and she heard God call her name. She had been born again at age 9, but her unhappiness drove her deeper into faith. She says that she came home later that day from a beauty appointment full of liquid love. That's in quotes. I didn't make that up. And was drunk with the Spirit of God that night while at the local bowling alley. Nothing against bowling. I love to bowl, but that's funny. It's a funny place to meet the Lord. Yes. So in, in her, in her um, sermons... She speaks humorously, sharing with her audience her own shortcomings. She takes some playful jabs at stereotypical church behavior. And a particular crowd favorite from her is her robot routine, in which she goes into a stiff-armed stiff -armed imitation of a robot, chanting, what about me, what about me? So it seems a little just totally wacko beans to me. Yes, it does. But obviously a lot of people like her, and I'm not going to criticize that. But I'm not impressed. She um, she has doctorates. Um, one was from... She has a doctoral degree from Life Christian University, an unaccredited institution in Tampa. That's down by where Tara Lintz lived. Right. Now, she's also been given an honorary doctorate of divinity by the Oral Roberts University. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say she's not really educated. You think... That's, that's a limb. Careful, it is doesn't it get list? sawed off. There. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, no, she isn't. She's no. got some phony degree from a non-credited school. Yeah. And then she's got an honorary degree from Oral Roberts. Right, right. So that's not I, too I, impressive. I think we're in enough trouble with some religious people anyway, so let's leave it at that. Okay. Well, you know, there was actually some appeals. There was an appeal in 2011... I got appeals. That was denied. And then there was an appeal in 2014. Can you tell us about the 2014 appeal? We have the whole got the document whole thing. here. So but it, tell us the basis of the 2014 appeals. Well, the, the basis is basically that none of the testimony should have been allowed. Okay? Okay. So they, they said that the court erred in allowing the state to present the testimony of an expert linguist on the issue of author ship attribution. They uh, said the court erred in allowing the state to present sexually explicit photographs and videos of Tara Lentz. And of him. He actually had some masturbating videos right. that they played. Um, the trial erred, the court erred in allowing five witnesses to testify to hearsay statements attributed to Sherry. They erred in the admitting the expert testimony of Lindell Moore 
who was comparing the spray-painted writings found at the murder scene to the defendant's handwriting. The trial court erred in admitting the testimony of the computer experts who testified by, about the Internet protocol IP addresses. Wait, so they're saying that they shouldn't have been allowed to testify about the IP addresses? Right. Okay. Well, that okay. just seems like factual. I don't understand the that. The court erred in allowing the admission of a hardware store receipt and in allowing a witness to testify to its content. What? And whether the evidence adduced at trial proved defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, hold the phone. He went and bought the red spray paint with his credit card, so his name was on the receipt. Right. So... I mean, you read this and, and you laugh, and as it turns out, the appeal was denied. Yeah, they upheld the conviction. They upheld the conviction. Great. Okay. And then Sherry's parents sued Joyce Meyer's ministry. Yeah, they have a civil suit. In a civil suit. Sure. Saying they're claiming that they didn't act appropriately at the receipt of these threats. I could see that. So... The first time the suit came around, it was dismissed. Right, in 2013. And then in 2014, an appellate court offered a different opinion. So they said that given the gravity of the threats, it was objectively reasonable to anticipate that some harm might come to the Coleman family. And it may also be reasonable to infer that Sherry Coleman did not have an equal and independent means to investigate the threats and that Sherry Coleman relying on Joyce Meyer's ministry's promises to investigate the threats and to provide security did not take steps to protect herself and her children from the threatened harm. So they're basically saying that it was beholden on the ministry to investigate them. I agree, but then on the other hand, Chris was their chief of security. So they should have had an independent person. The police, I believe, should have had an independent person. Well, yeah, they should have. Yeah. I mean, there, and there's things you can you can question. I mean, it'd be nice if it had been investigated. It, it'd be nice if one of Sherry's friends had gone to the police and said, I have That's a, a, whole other issue. a friend who's being abused by her husband. Right. There's lots of things. Yeah. Well, but I don't sadly want to sound enough, like I'm blaming the victims. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, sadly enough, Sherry didn't report these things, which is sad. Yeah. Yeah. Which you would hope that one of her friends would have, but they didn't either. But it's just a tough spot to be in when you have a woman that's denying it. Right. I mean, it's I hard mean, to push that on a person. She says, on the one hand, he did it, and then she says, but he's never going to do it again. Right, right. And another person found bruises, but she never ever said, my husband did them. So it's it's tough. Now, they decided that Tara Lintz didn't have anything to do with the murder plot, but how do you feel about her culpability otherwise? Do you think she has any? Not really. I don't. I mean, I I know she was pushing him, and, and maybe uh, he killed his family sooner than he was initially planning to, but he'd been plotting this for several months anyway. Yeah, but he plotted it after he started the relationship with her. Yeah. Yeah. But... I don't think she pushed him. Well, I don't think she pushed him to murder her either. No. But I just thought she was a little strange when I heard that she was wearing his promise ring when she testified in the murder trial. I thought, well, that's really odd. Does no. that mean that she's forgiving him? That's creepy. Yeah. So that just made me think. Fortunately, she's since given up wearing a promise ring. And oh, think, that's good. I think she returned it or something or tossed it. Okay. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, you know what? Here at Team Tie Grabber, we don't preach prosperity gospel. <laughs> well, it wouldn't work anyway, would it? <laughs> and God doesn't give us money for being good. No. No. We're, we're more richly rewarded. Yes. And we rely on listener support to replenish the Tie Grabber Temple. So joining Team Tie Grabber is easy. Memberships start at just $2 a month. Dick and I are planning a members only podcast for December. And my hope is to do one per month, starting in 2017. But if you don't think joining is for you, maybe you could bless us with offerings from Amazon. Just do your shopping through tigrabber.com forward slash Amazon, and we will receive pennies on the dollar you spend at Amazon. 
and this costs you nothing, and the pennies really add up to help us pay for our media storage, recording equipment, um, some important software updates we're doing, and not to mention beer. Don't forget the beer. What would True Crime Brewery be without beer? Wouldn't be a brewery, would it? No, it wouldn't. No. And we also have a contest coming up, don't we? We do. We announced it last week. And, and just for those who might not have listened last week, although we had our best week ever for we had, people we listening. Had a, we had a lot of downloads last week. But just to remind people, we're, we're having a contest with the prize of a free True Crime Brewery t-shirt awarded to the winner of the best beer review. So this is going to run from November 1st to January 1st. And I want a beer review of your choice that's original, well-written, and uh, a good beer. And by a good beer, I mean not Budweiser. Okay. Now, what mm -hmm. about, wait a minute, what about Corona? Give me a Corona review. Yeah. What about Shipyard? Sure. But these aren't microbreweries. I don't want Budweiser. I don't want Coors. I don't want Miller. I'm trying to see where you draw the line. Well, I get to decide that. Oh, well, I think we should let people know so they have a fair chance. Okay. Yeah. So, just briefly. Although I, I think our listeners probably have great taste in beer, and it's a moot point. I want craft beers reviewed. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Now, here's the hooker on this. Or the hook. Or the hook. <laughs> here's, here's the No ho hookers. <laughs> here's the hook on this. Okay. I want a spoken word review. Absolutely. I don't want... A written one. So it's got to be spoken. You can do this on the voicemail link at tigrabber.com or you can do an audio file on your computer or smartphone and attach it to an email and send it to truecrimebrewery at tigrabber.com. I'm not going to worry about audio quality. No. That's not going to come into consideration. I want a good beer review. So what will you be judging it for? What are your categories? Originality and writing. Okay. Creativity? In a, in a nutshell. Creativity beer goes choice? with originality. What about beer choice? I already covered that. Well, I'm just thinking, what if someone does a great beer review and it's like a, it's a craft beer, but it's not the greatest craft beer? That's okay. Because you're not going to use your judgment on the beer. No. No. I just don't want Anheuser-Busch or something like that in there. Okie so doke. Don't give me a Bud Light review. Okay. All right. All right. So get your entries in. We're already looking at a few. I'm going to announce the winner sometime in early January. Yeah, check it out on Facebook, on Twitter, or on Instagram, a picture of the T-shirt. It's a cool it's, shirt. it's a great-looking shirt. It is. Yep. It's a, an American Eagle, soft cotton, body-flattering, comfortable, great T-shirt. All cotton. Yep. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's all cotton. Oh, I ne never mind. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have said that. But it's very soft. It's a good-looking shirt. It's a high-quality T-shirt, yes. All right. And you know what I was thinking? What were you thinking, Jill? I was thinking, let's give him a coaster, too, a shirt and a coaster. Whoa. Because we don't want them walking around and not having anything to put their beer glass on. True. Okay, so you win a T-shirt and a coaster. Well, the ante's gone up here. Yeah, you never know. In a couple of weeks, we might throw in a snifter. Who knows? We have until January 1st to play around with it. We do. Yep. So get those entries in. I'm, yep. I'm ready to go. Okay. All right. So make sure that you tell your friends to listen to True Crime Brewery. We're on Stitcher. We're on Google Play. iTunes, of course. And the newest thing is that we're on iHeartRadio starting last week. Woohoo! Yep. So we got a lot of listeners on iHeartRadio. And you can visit our website, tigerever.com. You can leave your voicemail with feedback, or you can join the contest and leave your beer review there also. Go for it, guys. Yep. And girls. And don't forget to support us at tigerubber.com forward slash Amazon when you're doing your holiday shopping. That really helps us out a lot. So for tonight, we're saying bye-bye, and we will see you at the quiet end. All right. Bye, see guys. See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>